in order to be strategic, you have to be persuasive and influential. And it's not just with the founder, CEO, but it's also with like your peers on the C-suite level. It's not just, can you be persuasive in a one-to-one relationship with the founder, but can you make sure that all of the other strategic peers at your level are bought in to the work that you're doing? I'm Margaret Kelsey. And I'm Devin Bramhill. And this is Don't Say Content. And shout out to our producers at Share Your Genius. They're great at creating shows with strategic outcomes in mind. They've been with us since the podcast was just an idea, and they helped us bring it to life from strategy all the way to execution, and we absolutely love partnering with them. So if you, dear listeners, are thinking of launching a podcast, which you definitely should, by the way, we recommend having a conversation with our favorite people over at Share Your Genius. Now let's get into it. Many thanks, doing so. Many thanks, doing it. Check in the box, doing it. Check in the box. This is episode three. We're diving into the facets of why CEOs and marketers don't get along. No, we already did that one. This is episode three, my dear. Oh, you re-prepared for the episode we already recorded. This is something that comes up a lot. And it's the fact that marketers need to be business strategists, right? And this interplay, this relationship between business strategy and marketing strategy and why marketers fail so often is that they can't either attach itself to business strategy or that there is no business strategy because the organization as a whole is maybe flailing in terms of strategic leadership. And so marketing doesn't know what to do. Well, I think there's this funny thing about how marketing there's two ways of viewing it. There's like this common view of it as more of a creative growth role. And then there's like the business strategy role side. And I think that's typically where like a VP or a CMO lives, where like they're already doing business strategy more than anything. But it's just not fully, because it's not necessarily recognized and documented structurally in that C suite, I think it becomes a missed opportunity for companies to get better use from their marketing department by seeing it as a business strategy department over a creative growth strategy. Like, remember how back in the day, like we used to do partnerships with other companies and those took lots of different forms. And like, I remember one time a competitor shut down when I was working at SpringPad And one option is to buy the company on going out and that would be like a strategic acquisition. And then how do you use that to grow your user base, et cetera? That's a marketing heavy role. But then the thing that our product guy came up with was our CEO at the time was, let's just create a tool that helps people transfer all their data from that one to this one, market that in these strategic places. Like a marketing role could come up with that, right? It wouldn't have to be on product because we think of it in this more creative side. The marketers aren't in that mindset to be thinking that strategically. And those who are like CMOs, poor CMOs, they're in that position, but they don't usually get listened to enough. So that's something to unpack too. Exactly what you're saying. I think that the business level strategy can come from being able to see the strategic opportunities in the market because you're so tied into the market, right? Because you're bringing the product to market. So you should be the market expert. Market and marketing, I feel like can sometimes mean two different things. But you think of yourself as being the market expert, then you should be able to be the one that is looking at the market and can see the strategic opportunities that the business can grow into. But I think another thing here and and something that I forget of whether it was a conversation that we had offhand when we weren't recording an episode or Maybe it was something you wrote about, but you were talking about the fact that when you go to school for marketing, you learn that marketing is about the four P's, right? And so talk to me a little bit about that. Like, I think that the folks, I didn't go to school for marketing. I went to school for public relations, which was not in the school of business. It was in the school of communications, right? PR and communications, I think was in the same school, which was adjacent to the business school. So talk to me a little bit about if I was classically trained and went to school to be a marketer, what are the four P's? Oh, I don't, I didn't go to school for marketing either. But you had written, you would like talked about this to me or written about it. Did I? Wow. Um, I don't know, honestly, because I tend to reject like all of that, you know, 
Well, I pulled it up. So do you want me to tell you what the four P's are? Yeah, it's people, product. Product, price, place, and promotion. Oh, sure. Yeah. Let's add in a fifth one. Five P's of marketing. People, product, price, place, and promotion. Well, I think people are like, that's what all those things serve or like are supposed to. Either way, I think it's stupid. Like, I don't get it. It doesn't matter. I think it's like none of us went to school for marketing. Our generation didn't go to school for marketing unless we went to business school, in which case you weren't learning the kind of marketing that we're practicing in the B2B SaaS world anyway. Taking a step back from the current structure to look at the structure from a higher level, just looking at the CMO, VP, director of marketing roles, like what do you see as major differences between those? Because I think this applies. I agree. And I think when I'm thinking about like as you rise up those different levels, and I think one of the challenges is that we've started to just call people heads of marketing. If you get to be the top one, if there's nobody above you, you just get the head of title. But I think the thing that is frustrating about that is you actually don't know what to work on in terms of getting to, let's say, a director to a VP level to a CMO level and what those skill sets are. But when I think about it, it, it's really about timelines, right? And I think a CMO is looking out at a longer timeline for the company to say, what is this thing in three to five years? A VP might be looking at a year out. A director level is probably looking at what do we need to do the next quarter, the next six months, right? And so when I think of that head of marketing title, I think what it diminishes is the idea of, well, how long should I be looking out? And a head of marketing might be surrounded by other either heads of that are all looking to the founder of the company to say, what's our three to five year vision? Or they're looking at, you know, maybe there's a couple C-level execs and a couple heads of and a couple mixed bags. And then who is that executive team that's aligning to that long picture vision? The thing that I talk to a lot of founders about is that the tricky part of marketing is that it has to attach itself to business strategy, but then it has to operate out ahead of business strategy, right? And product strategy. So your product might be lagging behind what marketing is moving into. And that's a feature, not a bug. Like marketing should be seeding out ahead of your product being able to do the the functionalities and the capabilities. And it's okay to market a little bit aspirationally of where your business is moving towards so people get comfortable with the fact that your business is in that trajectory, but you have to know what that trajectory is for marketing to be able to go and execute on that. And so it's the song and dance of the fact that business and product strategy need to be baked at that level, at that time frame, and then marketing needs to go out ahead of that to be able to market it effectively. And so the marketer, if they don't, or if they're too junior and they're just absorbing or accepting whatever the business and product strategy is and not an active collaborator in those conversations on what it should be, but instead just say like, hey, deliver me the business and product strategy, and then I'll go create the marketing strategy. That's where I think this disconnect happens. And I think to be a strategic enough marketing leader to sit in those meetings, to have a point of view, but also to bring insights about the market and where the business should be moving towards, that's where that magic really starts to happen. And you start to be an effective marketing leader that brings something to the table rather than just accepts whatever is happening and then goes and executes a plan based on that. Yeah. What an interesting point about that. Like, I like the timeline framing because it helps also delineate roles and responsibilities, which I think helps people collaborate better together make progress more efficient because I think there's a bit of fighting for strategy, honestly, amongst like from CMO to VP to director, because those roles are so poorly defined. I think there's been a bit of influence from early stage startup founders needing to write these role descriptions, even though they don't really know how to write them. Now we've sort of just like copy and pasted a format of a role that doesn't really work. And that's influenced other companies, I think, to a negative degree. And so if we could just sort of recenter everybody on what a CMO is supposed to do, give them the power they need to do that, which I think some has been relegated to other departments, and then focus on your timeline model, people can really start to be put in places that make a lot of sense. Because to be honest, your business should have a plan far enough ahead that marketers can market ahead. Like that shouldn't be difficult for you. Like I think if earlier on it is because you're still learning as you grow, especially if you're in the like product market fit phase. But even once you're not, there's still a lot of that like user based 
feedback changes that you engage in that like become put everybody in reactive mode. Yeah. When we're talking about startups, which I think a lot of times our conversations are centered around this idea that you are newly bringing a product to market and you're trying to figure out the product market fit and maybe you figured out product market fit and you're just beyond that. I think the easier thing to do is to have a founder that's obsessed with a specific problem for a specific type of person. And then the product can look different. There can be many different ways for a problem, a product to solve the problem for that specific person. But marketing can still stay centered on the fact that this is our target audience and this is the problem we're solving for. And that can become a little bit of that like overall brand strategy, right? As we know who we're focused on, we know the type of people that we want to go after. We know the problem space that they live in. And then product market it falls underneath that layer of like, once we know that our product is actually solving the problem, we can talk about the specific ways that that happens. But marketing can sit a little bit further out than that. I think oftentimes what's been happening is startup founders will be interested in solving a problem for someone out there, or they'll be so interested in the product that they've created that they try to bring it to market and try to find an audience for it to try to find a, like, will this actually work for any end user? And that's a challenging place for marketing to be in because it feels really thrashy of right now we're going to sell to product managers. No, actually we're going to sell to engineers because maybe that's the better use case. No, actually it's more of a UX design case than it is an engineering case. And so marketers are like, what the heck? Like, what is my marketing strategy? Because I have to switch who I'm targeting, the channels in which they live, the messages in which that resonate with them and all of those different things. And so this is more as like a head of marketing or a CMO going into a company. If you see consistency in the founder's interest in solving a problem, a specific problem for a specific type of user or a specific type of audience, that's an easier thing to then build marketing strategy off of because those things will be consistent. It's much harder if you have a product and you're going to try to bring it to market or try to test out if anyone will ever use this thing. Yeah. Though I, I don't know that the like audience target thing, like I just have a hard time finding that useful anymore because it's really a series of like your target customer is really a group of people with similar micro use cases that all boil up to customer support or like marketing ops or something. And I think that as a first marketer on the marketing hire on a team, what I've seen, and I think who I've even been in the past at early stage startups is someone who's like, you're setting me up for failure. Like there's too many changes. I can't follow anything through, blah, blah, blah. It's like, that is valid and true. Also, the founder needs you to be flexible. This is the part where they need to be able to experiment a little bit, but they also need boundaries because what we also see is that if you're too flexible as a marketer, you don't achieve anything. And then they're like, the founder's like, you suck at your job. And you're like, well, like, especially because you're changing it so much that like, I'll start something and not even be able to finish it. How can we, going back to your point, it's like, how can you create a goal that's above all of that experimentation? Like ultimately, we're trying to get here and make it something that enables all this experimentation to result in progress and keep the marketer and get the marketer and founder to ag agree on that, right? I think if you can get them to agree on what the stakes are, what the objective is, then have a conversation about like the founder being like, look, I had to test some stuff out. I don't know. And the marketer being like, okay, typically for your test to be effective, for, for me to market your test effectively, I need a little bit of time. Like I can't just like suddenly whip it up and put it out and have anything happen. How can we work together to manage these experiments and get what we need for this goal above it. What maybe, and maybe that goal is information. You're learning through these experiments and documenting it properly so you can actually use it to improve. Whereas most of the time, both are kind of scrambling, like marketing is trying to scramble to keep up with the founder who's testing a bunch of stuff. And it never, you know, it's not the same. It's like, let's agree that we're doing an experiment. We want to get information to help us focus in the next quarter. I think that would be so much more effective and set you up in the future for when you get further like marketing hires at higher levels 
you already kind of set up for that person to be more of a strategist than an executor. I mean, I always think about all those different variables of marketing, and it's really useful to go in, especially if you're new to an organization, but even if you've been in an organization for a while, to look at all of those different variables of marketing and understand your own maturity on them, right? Do we understand who's using our product, who's the best fit user right now, and who we would want to be in the future? Like, what percent confidence do we have in that understanding? Do we understand what they care about? Do we understand what message they glom onto, what things resonates with them? Do we understand how they walk through the world, how they're gathering information? Do we understand how they purchase a product like this? Who do they go to? What channels do they find information in? How do they go about deciding on whether or not to buy something? Do we understand what thing actually prompts them to go buy it? Like, what's that final thing? Are they price sensitive? Do they care about quality? Do they care about ROI and impact? Like all of those different things, I think, are really helpful to then document because then as a strategic leader, you get to say, oh, hey, listen, we're good on eight out of 10 of these strategic measures, but we have no idea about these two things. So at an executive level, we're going to align that this next quarter, we're going to get better at all those other things, but we're going to really focus on getting from zero to one on whatever those other pieces are. Like we have no idea what thing actually gets them to make the leap and convert and either to talk to our sales team or to get into the product. So let's focus there. And I think that's a more strategic conversation to have rather than what marketers tend to do, which is drawn into you know, what tactics or programs or new shiny ideas are we going to run? It's like looking at it at that, that level of like, what do we understand right now? And where can we go point the team to gather more information can be really valuable. Yeah. And like, where can we get scrappy? I remember when growth hacking was like a role and it's like, my views on it were different back then. But now I look at it, I'm like, no, that's business strategy. And the marketer at the appropriate level should just be that. And should just do that. And that was something that, again, got relegated into growth hacker. And then there's like email growth marketer and social media manager and then like video marketing. It's like it got so broken up into small pieces. It's like, who's really owning the whole? Like, is the CMO really like tracking the whole of all of this? The number of times that I used to talk to people at animals, like potential customers, and say, like, I don't know if you really need marketing right now. A potential client I talked to last year is like, she came in with encouragement from her board saying, yeah, you need marketing. And one of their investors was like, do you? And they were like, hey, will you talk to her? And I was like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, wait, you're getting tons of organic word of mouth driven signups because you created a legitimate net new product. Like you didn't just join a crowded space like everybody else. You're like, you actually created something net new for a group of people who don't like being marketed to. You did it already. Like you're getting tons of, and your product like isn't perfect. You're kind of churning a lot too at the same time, but it's like, you don't really need this in the first place. And I think that's what like a really good, like a marketer whose job is a business strategist isn't going to feel so protective if their goal is business growth versus marketing. Because then it's like, you think about marketing in the abstract and aren't so like, but what if I lose my job? Well, exactly to your point, I think that being invited into that business level strategy conversation or demanding that there actually is a conversation at that level of business strategy, to your point, so helps against that whole idea of like, oh, I lost X percent of my budget this year and now I feel bad about it versus I understand that to, for this business to succeed, that we need to redirect funds that used to be for marketing when we were thinking that we were on the great path into product to shore up whatever it is, retention, product usage, development of a new feature or product that can help us expand into a larger market. And so you understand those decisions and it doesn't feel as penalizing. And I think that's the thing too with this. It's so funny that this is turning into me shitting on like head of marketing as a title. But I think that's the thing that gets lost with the head of marketing title is you might be a director level by your own growth so far in your career. And the executive layer might not think you're ready for those conversations. So they're just delivering you a budget in which to operate in rather than once you get to the point where you can be at that strategic C-suite level and you can have a thoughtful conversation about it. 
I also think that founders and CEOs need to probably bring in junior marketers, especially if it's a head of and try to have those conversations with them, even if they're not ready. But that to me is that messiness that comes with a head of is like, is it a director level that you're just giving a budget and saying, do the best you can with it? Or is it somebody higher up that you can actually bring into that conversation and say, what are you seeing? Where could we be focusing funds? How would you, if you were in my position, how would you split up this budget in terms of what our biggest business bets and and risks are right now? You know what? I mean, I think this really makes the case that like more CEOs should come from marketing backgrounds than product. I hate to say, well, no, I don't hate to say it, but I think it's just like you're able, because like I think about a company that I used to work for and the product wasn't great. And like they picked a cohort that would not logically adopt tech in the first place, let alone our thing. Like we were basically trying to build communities online among small businesses. And it's like, I remember having to call like people on the phone at a store because that's how they wanted to communicate. Like they didn't even know how to use their email. That's the hill we were climbing. But one of them came from a marketing background and one of them was like an inventor. He invented like a Visalign and something to do with the Star Wars technology, like in a movie. So it's like our product kind of sucked, but it was fine. And I, they like still grew and I think are still growing because you're like, you've got someone who could like keep the business going, even though the product is only marginally useful for anyone. Like the whole business case was like, you can help each other thrive more. I'm like, I highly doubt it's done any of that because it certainly wasn't when we were there. And it took so much analog work to get it in the first place. But like, because you had a marketer co-running the company and you had a product guy who was like good at gamifying shit, it's like, okay, the company kept going. It wasn't even well run. That's not even like an opinion. Anyway, point being, I really think that like a product person has some merit in that decision. But I think ultimately a marketer's whole job is to step back more. And that's not a product person's role as much. I know they probably think it is, but like, not really. Like there's a finite place you can take a product. I mean, I'm thinking back to like, if we were in marketing 101 class in college, which neither of us were in, and they talk about the fact of role of marketing as one of them being product, it's thinking about product development as much as it is product marketing, right? It's not just like, oh, the features were delivered by the engineering team or the product team. How do we market them? But truly, how do we direct based on the signals we see in the market for the product to move into the place that we need to be? And then how do we obviously market it and and wrap it up in a pretty bow and make sure that it's useful? There's a fun example of this that I was just floored by that I saw the other day, which is in the consumer space. And those sweetheart candies, those like Valentine's heart candies, they're marketing this year as the rejects. So all of the ones that didn't get stamped appropriately in the factory that are hard to read are being marketed as like situationship candy, like conversation hearts, because like you can't really see what they mean or what they read. So somebody I imagine in the marketing function, I didn't go digging to see whose idea this was, but it reads like a marketer, right? Who's like, this could be a product. All of these discards, all of these things that aren't working could be packaged in a way that then is perfect for a new target audience that maybe is not buying as many of these like little conversation hearts anymore for Valentine's Day. Maybe they've moved into other types of candies. It's essentially a new product, right? Or at least a new packaging of an existing product or a discard product. But that should feel like the responsibility of a marketing team is to be identifying, hey, culturally, we have this rise of everyone talking about situationships because we're in this, you know, tech dating app enabled world where everything's a little bit messier in terms of what we're actually doing here. We have these discarded things that we normally probably throw away or do whatever to like this could be its own product in the market. And I think it was just, it's so genius. You're creating a product out of thin air. You're basically recreating a product that already exists. Yeah. If anyone that listens knows who did that, I would love to talk to the person that had that idea because I think it is just so genius. Yeah. I love that. And that's kind of the creative side of things too, that merges with the business strategy is like those creative minds merge with strategic goals where we're like, you used to waste all this money on discarded ones. Now you can increase your revenue this year. And if it takes off, not only can we keep doing it, but now we can make a whole new line of marketable candies that people will buy. And it's like, 
kind of a step above the like, oh, let's just create another flavor of Reese, another kind of Reese's. And you're leaning into the fact that you're literally just repackaging. Like it's a very honest thing. And that's the next level that I drilled into because I was like, oh, if they're purposefully misprinting candy, that's a little stupid. But then like when I read the press release or whatever the article was, it was like, no, this is actually like the rejects that normally wouldn't go to market. I love that so much. I was thinking about this, thinking more about the like product person and like relatability to the customer. I'm like, trying to think to the other side, like, no, engineers and product people, they do try to get to know the customer and they do try to think from their point of view, but then why does that always pan out? And I was thinking about my friend C. Todd, who is that person. And I was like, yeah, but he does really deep dives into the customers and he's the one mapping it. Like he really is like thoughtful. He's written books on it, extremely passionate about it. And I'm like, yeah, but he does it well. Like what is the thing. But then I think back to his past roles and the problem is he's not even always listened to. Right. And so like he can also lead a horse to water. And I think it's really like, which horse are you trying to get to drink? You know what I mean? Like at the end of the day, the person making the decisions has to kind of like buy into it and then stay focused on it long enough to pan it out. And I think that includes in your board too, is like boards are contributors to this mayhem also and can scatter founders and kind of put pressure on them. Yeah. To your point of that board saying, hey, go find a content agency because you need marketing and not just like you need marketing, but like literally pointed them to a content agency, which is like a very specific outcome that you would invest in. You would invest in it for a specific outcome rather than other types of marketing. Yeah. I feel like we're going to hang up And I'm going to immediately have a thousand more thoughts. And so are you. Like, I feel like we're actually just scratching the surface of something. Well, there's a piece here that I feel like we're getting into around in order to be strategic, you have to be persuasive and influential. And it's not just with the founder, CEO, but it's also with like your peers on the C-suite level. And so it might be that that's another topic that we dive into or another piece of this that we dive into later on this season is like, It's not just can you be persuasive in a one-to-one relationship with the founder, but can you make sure that all of the other strategic peers at your level are bought in to the work that you're doing? Yeah. And also, like, would all that work to be persuasive really be necessary if the structure was right? Like, structurally, you set the company up such that, like, a marketer was a strategic, like, growth function and thus automatically had that stuff under their... uh, ownership umbrella. I mean, persuasion is necessary, but it's such a waste of time. If companies could use their structure to put people in the right places and help decision trees and all that stuff, it'd be so much easier than people having to spend all this time persuading each other on things they've sometimes already agreed to. Oh, it's funny. I feel like that's probably where you and I differ, where I think this movement towards flatter organizations, less structure can actually be really powerful. I think that a lot of times the structure gets in our own way of feeling ownership or lack thereof. And I think the thing that I started to get better at in my career is this idea that like, I think this structure is an illusion. And I think it's a crutch that we rely on. But what I'm thinking about too here in terms of like, let's say CMO and a chief product officer, you do need to be able as a marketer to influence because there is an additional product organization. And I don't know, maybe you're making the case that the entire product organization should roll up through marketing. But if that's not the case, then I think that like those that peer relationship and the ability to influence becomes hypercritical, right, in order to get the product organization to be focused on the right thing. Yeah, I don't know that I'm having an opinion on like flat versus overly structured. Like, I don't think I have a strong opinion about that because I've seen it big corporations too much structure could get in the way as much as it can enable. So it really depends on the size of the company. And to a certain extent, when you get big enough, it's just mayhem at regardless. You know what I mean? Like, there's only so much you can do. So I don't know, like, I don't know if I have a strong opinion either way there. I just think that like, if the right roles and responsibilities were placed in the right roles and in the right places, I think some of that stuff that should be under marketing, if that person were like a strategist, should be taken from product, moved order marketing, and that would make things easier. But it's just that like, organically, it kind of turned out that way that product ended up owning it. And I don't understand why. Or I understand why it happened. I don't think it's 
the best way to do things necessarily. So this just turned into like a more of a thing than I even like, I did not realize this was going to be so much of a topic. And I'm like, wait, there's so many layers to this that we haven't even talked about yet. All right. So we've got more to talk about here. I think we're coming at this from a few different angles this year when we talk about how to hire for your first marketer, these different roles and such. So I think we're going to come at it, but definitely more to talk about in the future. We got to nowhere today as per usual. Thank God. We explored the messy middle and came out of it still in the mess. So (laughs) we'll chat more about this and many more. Have a great week, everybody. Okay, y'all, that's a wrap. Thank you, as always, for listening. We'll be back next week. And just remember, you're doing great. You're doing great. 30% of you are doing great. The rest, you got to get your shit together. Come on. You know which side you're on this week. You know. (laughs) You know. See you next week. Bye. Bye. The power of stickers cannot be overstated. The things we will do for a sticker, for a, a sticker chart, like it it hits that childhood, like, but even children like intrinsically know that stickers are good, right? Yes. You just you just described why we are friends. Like you get you understand. Not not that it's not that you understand me, which you do. It's that you understand the world. That core level. Yeah. Well, I have an almost four year old and I will tell you the things that a human being will do for a sticker. It's like, oh, you don't want to get into the car. You don't want to use the potty like stickers rule the world. I would do more for we should make don't say content stickers that make no sense. And it's just you only get it if you're a good listener, whatever that means.